I will uh, confess to you, as I usually do when this is the case, that I'm a little bit sleep deprived this morning, but I promise you that I'm going to work really hard to be the last person in the room to fall asleep. <laughs> All right, let me begin with a question. How many of you enjoy doing jigsaw puzzles? At least once in a while, right? You might not start one on your own, but there happens to be one out on the living room table somewhere. Maybe you're going to go over there because you want to be the person who picks up that piece and just magically pops it right in where it's supposed to go, right? Now, the funny thing is, I do enjoy doing jigsaw puzzles, but I'm not usually in life the most methodical person until I do a jigsaw puzzle. And then I do probably what a lot of you do, which is you take that box full of pieces and you comb through there and you find all of the, the edge pieces and the corner pieces, thank you, right? And then you look at the picture that you have on the box and you try to construct the frame and then you start sorting pieces by color and by pattern, right? I have even gone as far, once the puzzle is well underway, to sort pieces by shape so that I can find them more quickly, right? And somehow I've got to believe that somebody knows what those little things on the puzzle pieces are actually called, you know, so that you don't have to do the kind of thing that says, I want a piece that's got two of those sticking out thingies and two holes in it or something like that. But there's something just aesthetically gratifying about doing puzzles, about taking this pile of pieces that somehow don't seem to be related to each other and organizing them in such a way that little by little an aesthetically pleasing whole begins to form out of that. Now, the reason that I say that is that in some ways, this activity that we loosely call integration is a little bit like that. When we're trying to bring together psychology and Christian faith or theology, much of the work has been like doing interdisciplinary jigsaw puzzles, right? We gather the pieces that we think should fit together in some way, and we work diligently to connect them, and we experience a certain aesthetic pleasure when things actually come together. We may even harbor that sense that says, if we get enough people working on the puzzle, eventually the whole thing is going to be finished. Now, realistically speaking, however, there is a practical limitation to an interdisciplinary approach when we speak grandly, but a little bit vaguely, of the integration of psychology with theology, or with Christianity, or with the Christian faith. If I can use a distinction that was coined a number of years ago by Steve Boma Prediger, the ultimate fruit of an interdisciplinary approach to integration is somewhat limited by the lack of intradisciplinary integration, right? When you're trying to bring X and Y together, trying to integrate them is going to be made a little bit more difficult if there isn't much integration within X or within Y. I mean, think about what we have in the field of psychology. We have people who have empirical, theoretical, and clinical interests. You have a number of different projects that are going on in each of those, and those projects are being done from a number of different theoretical orientations. So you've got people who, even within a particular school of thought, don't always talk with each other as much as they possibly could, and the people within those schools of thought don't always communicate all that well with each other across those boundaries. Same thing could be said on the other side of the equation. We can use a word like theology or Christianity or even more broadly, again, faith. But when we do that, we're talking about something that has a broad array of different approaches and perspectives and so on. You have the different branches of theological study. You have the different traditions and beliefs and practices and all of them with their own distinctive historical roots. So when we're talking about intradisciplinary integration then, whether we're talking about psychology or theology, it's an ongoing task and somewhat of an elusive goal because you have this kaleidoscopic diversity of interests and perspectives. And if that's the case, then interdisciplinary integration, bringing those things together, cannot be one big jigsaw puzzle. It's thousands of puzzles with a number of people working on each of those puzzles, 
And part of what we're trying to struggle through is that the relationship between the puzzles is not clear, and it may even be unspecifiable. And of course, nobody has a box with a picture on it <laughs> that tells us which pieces go with which puzzle and which pieces go where. Is it an edge piece? Is it in the middle? And so on, right? Now, that's not to say that we should cease our interdisciplinary strivings, far from it, because that kind of creative conversation is enriching, and it can actually be a lot of fun to be able to do that. But what I'm thinking is that there may be another way to conceptualize the task of integration. We might ask ourselves, for example, if it's true that in some ways psychology and theology exist in blessed ignorance of each other, why should we bring them together? What would be the reason for doing that? Is it just because we enjoy doing puzzles? Or is there something else involved? What problem, in other words, does the integration attempt to solve? And what I'd like to propose in these lectures is one answer that expresses the way that I've taught integration for many years now. Because integration, in this view, is a personal matter of maintaining the integrity of one's vocational identity. Now that word integrity probably needs a little bit of explanation. Because usually when we use that word integrity, what we're talking about is a person who's trustworthy because they do what they say and they stick to their principles. And that's the way, as a matter of fact, that the American Psychological Association even describes integrity. That clinicians, as an ethical ideal, should aspire to be people who are honest and truthful, they avoid fraud and deception, they keep their promises. That kind of integrity requires an underlying unity and consistency of value, belief, and behavior. There's a prominent textbook on biomedical ethics that defines it this way. They talk about the virtue of integrity as, quote, a coherent integration of aspects of the self, emotions, aspirations, knowledge, and the like, so that each complements and does not frustrate the others. So now in a similar vein, I think of integrity as dependent on a kind of narrative coherence. And my suggestion here is that graduate education in a seminary environment often leaves students with less coherence than when they started. <laughs> I think I hit a nerve there. <laughs> Let me begin with an experiential description of what I'm talking about. Every year, I ask my students about the conversations that they had with their families before leaving home and coming to Fuller to study psychology. Were the conversations positive or negative? Were they supportive? Were they encouraging? Or were they discouraging? And of course, there are always going to be the naysayers in their, again, their families and churches. Some people will say, well, if you're going to go to seminary, that's OK but you ought to study to be a pastor or a missionary. Studying psychology to become a therapist? I mean, is that even a Christian thing to do? And there are some people who will say that the conversations were not overtly rejecting, but there was a little bit of suspiciousness involved in there. Like, can you learn to do real therapy in a school like that? Or are they just going to teach you to bash people with the Bible? And then, of course, there's the parental version of the question which is, so if you get a degree from a religious school instead of a well-respected secular university, can you get a real job and make money with that? Now, the good news is that I've continued to ask those questions, and I've seen a positive trend over time. More and more students are saying that the conversations that they had with their families and churches were encouraging conversations. As a matter of fact, more and more students are saying that they were referred to Fuller by a Fuller alum. So thank you for your referrals. There is also another trend in there that I should probably note that's a little bit more disturbing to me, and that is the longer I stay here, the more I get students coming to me at the beginning of the year and saying, do you remember having so-and-so as a student? That's my mom. She says hi. <laughs> But even when we begin graduate study riding this wave of optimism, we've been encouraged by family, there's still something that's potentially destabilizing about training to be a therapist. 
and doing so in the context of a theological seminary. It's not just the experience of having somebody rock your boat. It's the more fundamental discovery that you had a boat in the first place, <laughs> and sometimes more than one. And not only can that boat or those boats be rocked, sometimes they can be capsized. Welcome to seminary, <laughs> the place where people come to discover their vocation. Now, I want us to think together for a few moments about boat rocking, starting with our many and our various theological boats. Because under the broad uh, umbrella of evangelicalism, Fuller prides itself on its theological diversity, which is a great thing. We just need to note that that kind of diversity brings its own personal challenges with it. Now, if you were like me and you weren't raised in the church and you weren't raised in a Christian family, you might come to seminary and be ready for anything. You don't have a tradition to defend or some such thing. But perhaps instead, you were raised to be a dyed-in-the-wool five-point Calvinist. And you find yourself sitting in a classroom next to an Arminian, and the two of you are having conversations, and you realize that both of you are really disturbed by how the other person reads Paul. <laughs> and you're only just now learning the vocabulary to be able to talk about those differences between you. Or maybe you hail from a relatively staid liturgical tradition, and you come to chapel on Wednesday morning, and you constantly find yourself surrounded by people who insist on raising their hands during worship. <laughs> or even if the two of you come from the same tradition, some of the things that you might fret over are the differences in how the two of you are loyal to your tradition. One of you thinks that the other one is too ready to give it up too quickly, and the other one thinks that you're a stick in the mud. Or you're sitting in a Bible class, and for the first time, the very first time, you're listening to a lecture on Psalms, and you're exposed to the idea that your favorite Psalm, the one that you always pull out in times of distress, may not have been written by King David. <laughs> and some of the other students in the class seem to take that all in stride, and sometimes with a little bit of a doctrinaire attitude that says, well, <laughs> everybody knows that, right? But you don't necessarily know that yourself. And you're wondering if it means that you can't trust your Bible anymore. And you don't want to say anything about it, because if you do, you're going to sound out of place, perhaps even foolish. And so you deal with it in the way that you learn to deal with things in college. You put your head down. You keep your doubts to yourself. You say what the professor wants to hear. And you figure you'll settle up with God later. <laughs> now, pedagogically speaking, we professors work hard to broaden our students' intellectual horizons. But it's actually pretty easy to forget how even a simple and seemingly harmless bit of broadening can provoke a crisis of meaning, whether it's a big one or a little one. I remember, for example, trying to explain to someone in our church the meaning of the term penal substitutionary atonement. And she replied, well, that's what I've always believed. I just didn't know it had a name. And that was fine until she thought about it for a second and realized the implication of there being a theological it to name in the first place. And her next question was a little bit more anxious because she said, well, does that mean that there are some Christians who don't believe that? A little bit of a crisis and an unintended one. Now, let me be quick to point out that our theological boats, of course, aren't the only ones to be rocked, because exposure to new psychological ideas can be personally challenging in its own right. And this, too, occurs in the context of learning competing schools of thought. In a course that I teach on family systems, for example, I ask questions that prod people to apply the theories to their own lives. You're learning new terminology. You're learning new words. And those words make certain behaviors and relationship patterns nameable in a way that perhaps you haven't noticed them before. And the experience can be empowering. But sometimes the experience also raises and opens up old wounds, things that haven't been resolved just yet. And similar experiences await in other classes because self-examination is a necessary part of training to be a clinician. 
Moreover, the potentially destabilizing effect of education can happen even if the professor doesn't push students to apply the material to their lives personally. To be a therapist, for example, you have to learn diagnostic skills, you have to read the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. You have to love a title like that, right? <laughs> And it's one thing if you're in a class and you're studying just to pass the exam, right? But it's another thing to read that and to be struck by the depth and the variety of ways in which people suffer psychologically. And it's still another to read the DSM and see your own psychological suffering or those of your family members and friends described in its pages. So education then forms us. It forms us in positive ways, and it forms us in negative ways. It constructs and it deconstructs, it builds up, and it tears down. To describe that process from another angle, I've sometimes used this diagram to capture what I believe to be part of the experience of graduate theological education, and as I'll say a little bit later on, psychological education as well, and how it relates to one's background and formation. The word theology in the center of the diagram isn't the more limited notion of that. We're not just talking about the doctrine of God. We're not just talking about the professional behavior of scholars and pastors and even seminarians. I have in mind something like the opening lines of Stan Grenz's book, Theology for the Community of God, in which theology is or should be understood as an activity of the church. Quote, every Christian is a theologian whether consciously or unconsciously, each person of faith embraces a belief system. And each believer, whether in a deliberate manner or merely implicitly, reflects on the content of these beliefs and their significance for the Christian life. So if you look at the horizontal axis of the diagram, that represents the fact that this reflection is sometimes done individually in the privacy of our own thoughts and sometimes corporately in our life together as believers. Corporate theological reflection, of course, can happen in the seminary classroom, but it also happens in the Sunday school classroom. It happens in shared liturgy and worship, and even in God-focused conversation between friends. The vertical axis represents that distinction in the quote that I just read you between what is conscious and what is unconscious, what is explicit and what is implicit. And I realized that in that quote, uh, Stan Grants was not intending to use the words conscious and unconscious in any technical psychological sense, but I find the idea of unconscious or implicit reflection to be a little opaque because the word reflection seems to indicate some kind of deliberate thought. So I prefer the distinction in Michael Polanyi's work between focal and subsidiary forms of awareness. So what does that mean? One of Polanyi's favorite illustrations of the two types of awareness is the activity of driving a nail with a hammer. Okay? And if you've ever done something like that, you know that it looks easy, but it's not as easy as it looks. At a tacit level, at a subsidiary level, you're aware of how the hammer feels in your hand. It's heft, it's balance, and even Sometimes that little bit of a wobble when you pick the thing up that lets you know that the head on the hammer is a little bit loose and you need to be careful, right? You pick that thing up, you're aware of these things, and you automatically adjust your grip and the way that you swing it, right? But your attention has to be on the head of the nail. If you're trying to hit that nail and you start focusing on the hammer, you're going to hit something else, and it might be your finger, now, if you're a neurologist and you hear that description, you might think of proprioception, that ongoing awareness that we have of our body parts and how we're moving through space. That kind of awareness, that proprioceptive awareness is tacit or subsidiary in the way that Polanyi describes. Because if we don't have it, without it, even the most basic tasks can be overly difficult to do. They become awkward, they become laborious. I remember a case study that was described by Oliver Sacks once, who talked about a young woman named Christina who had a very damaging kind of neuropathy that took away her proprioception. She could not walk without having to look down at her legs and focus on them and will one leg to move and then the other one to move. If she lost her concentration, she would fall down. <laughs> 
She couldn't even sit up in a chair by herself straight without it having to be a continuous act of will. Now, Polanyi's claim is that all knowing has a tacit dimension like that. And I think that insight helps us to understand a little bit about the task of integration. So again, if we go back to the diagram and we look at that horizontal axis, again, there's a dialectical relationship between individual theological reflection on one hand and the corporate theological conversations that we may have. But we need to add a tacit dimension to that. I mean, after all, hopefully, when we are either in the lectern or in the pulpit and we are teaching theology explicitly, we're hoping that we're doing more than just adding to people's intellectual storehouse of ideas. What we're trying to do is to shape people's character. We're trying to shape their moral and their theological imagination at a more subsidiary or tacit level. So learning the meaning of penal substitutionary atonement, for example, isn't just for passing a theology exam. It's for forming people whose lives are characterized by a deep and abiding wonder at the grace and the mercy of God. Moreover, our theological imagination is shaped by our participation in Christian community, even when there's no explicit focus on theology. We've probably heard dozens of sermons about love, for example. Perhaps we have meditated on and even memorized 1 Corinthians 13. But what we truly know about love, way down in our spiritual and our psychological bones, is also a matter of what we have observed in community with others, what we've experienced in those relationships. Many students come to seminary, and they've been loved well by their families and by their communities. And they've had models of faithfulness to admire and to emulate. But others have spent time in congregations where it was unsafe to speak openly about the lack of congruence between the talk and the walk, between what people profess to believe and how they actually lived. And that experience was just as formative, if not more so, than anything they heard from the pulpit. Now, a person then could make similar observations about our psychological imagination. Because how we understand human motivation and behavior is shaped not only by what we read and study, but by the history of our relationships and the folk wisdom of our families and communities. And the latter, that folk wisdom, can be quite resistant to change, whatever the textbooks and the empirical evidence might actually say. And our shared but uncritical use of language makes a difference as well. Tragically, for example, I think of the number of school shootings that we've had in the US already this year, and we're not even done with February yet, right? But when we get together with other people, whether at church or in our families and so on, perhaps even on social media, how do we talk about events like that? Have we ever, as we're describing it to somebody else, talked about the nutcase who went mental and started shooting innocent people? Because when we do, what we're doing is reinforcing negative stereotypes of the mentally ill as dangerous and unpredictable. Even within our churches, we may have internalized what Marsha Webb has recently called negative lay theologies of psychological disorder. Long-term, great idea, right? Negative lay theologies of psychological disorder. And those lay theologies often stigmatize believers within our congregations. Now, I'll say more about the stigma of mental illness in the third lecture, but for now, I simply want to note that those conversations that we mentioned earlier about conversations you've had with your family, with your churches, about coming to study psychology occur against the background of lay theologies of psychological disorder, much of which may be tacit or subsidiary in nature. So our students come to us, having already been formed by their individual and communal experiences. What they hear in the classroom, what they read in their books, may agree with, may extend, may compli complicate, or sometimes even contradict what they already know. And much of that knowledge may be tacit. 
We have focal conversations and provocative readings and lectures that bring what is subsidiary out of the shadows. New ideas give students a language for thoughts that previously had only sort of tiptoed at the edge of awareness. Naming them gives them substance. And this is just as true of their psychological training as it is of the theological. So what does this have to do with integration? For Polanyi, the word integration points to the relationship between subsidiary and focal dimensions of knowing. Think, for example, about a concert pianist. Their focus is on the music. They're only tacitly aware of their hands and fingers. But both forms of awareness must be integrated into the performance. If they begin to focus on their fingers instead, even for a moment, the necessary tacit integration will be broken and the performance will falter. I say that knowing that we have two concert pianists in the room. Okay? <laughs> now, metaphorically, this describes the situation of many of our students. Figuring out how to reconcile what they've been learning in psychology and theology is difficult enough, but it's doubly so when the tacit integration that one had previously taken for granted has been undermined by the process of graduate study itself, which forces us to turn our attention from the music to our fingers. And to strain the metaphor just a little bit further, despite the frequently deconstructive and disintegrative nature of their educational experience, our students upon graduation will interview at and serve in contexts where they may be expected to play like virtuosos. Now we can state this in still another way. I'm reminded of what Walter Brueggemann in his discussion of evangelism once called the coherent construal of reality through faith. Through proclamation and imaginative response, people are invited to live into the dramatic narrative of scripture. Evangelism is not, Brueggemann insists, only for those who would be considered to be outsiders to the faith. It is also for the insiders who have become passive or disillusioned and need to have their imaginations revitalized. And it is especially for our children who must be taught to, quote, perceive, embrace, and enact the world according to the peculiar memory and vision of faith held by the gospel community. So in the terms that we've been using, one might say that evangelism at one level refers to making the good news an object of focal attention but the proclamation and practices appropriate to that news must also reach into our imaginations at a subsidiary level so that we perceive the world in terms of that tacit background and act accordingly. So I submit then that one of the problems that integration must address is the fragmentation of consciousness, imagination, and identity that can accompany the academic experience. And that's what I mean by saying that integration is a personal matter of integrity, understood as a sense of wholeness that is characterized by narrative coherence or coherent construal. Students may vary tremendously in terms of how coherent their theological and psychological construals of the world were before they entered seminary, but I think it's fair to say that the graduate school environment itself often leans more towards incoherence than toward coherence, and that the need for integration in part is created by that experience. Now, I'm not claiming that this is the only way to think about integration, but from a pedagogical standpoint, I believe that if we want to form students who have a robust sense of vocation, we need to think this way. And what remains for this lecture then is to explain what I mean by narrative coherence, what it has to do with vocation, and how both are linked with our overall theme of peacemaking. Okay, so what do I mean by narrative coherence? Anyone who's studied human development and particularly adolescent development is probably acquainted with Eric Erickson's idea that adolescence is a pivotal stage during which identity begins to form. That's an intrinsically meaning-making process. And it entails, as Dan McAdams has argued, a kind of tentative historiography that integrates our past with our present and into a relatively coherent story. Indeed, there is empirical evidence that life narratives become more coherent as individuals proceed through adolescence. But what is it that actually makes a narrative coherent? 
If you look in the literature on life narratives, Tillman Habermas and Suvison Bluck, for example, have suggested four different and overlapping kinds of coherence that may characterize how people understand and tell the stories of their lives. There's the notion of biographical coherence, which has to do with the extent to which the way that a person tells their life story matches up with the norms of the culture around them. There is temporal coherence, which has to do with the way that the events in a story are ordered in time. There is causal coherence, which has to do with the way that events in a story are linked to the things that cause them, whether inside or outside the person's immediate environment. And then there's thematic coherence, which refers to how the elements of a life story are joined together by thematic similarities. And it's this final thematic type of coherence that I want to dwell on. McAdams argues that while the formation of identity narratives properly begins in the teenage years, it doesn't end there. We continue to revise our life stories all through adulthood. And moreover, these stories aren't created just out of nothing when we reach adolescence. Early childhood experiences, for example, are going to determine whether or not that story has an overall positive or negative tone. And later, as they go through childhood, the story takes on one or more themes that will help gather together consistent, recurring hopes and intentions, both their own and of those other people who are characters in the story. Themes help to unite past, present, and future, knitting them together in a sense of who we have been, who we are now, and who it is that we wish to be. Now again, I'm proposing an understanding of integration as integrity by raising questions of narrative coherence, and in particular, I'm emphasizing the formation of a thematically coherent sense of vocation. Now, over the years, I've had many conversations with students about matters of vocation. Because some students arrive at seminary and they have a really clear and definite sense of call. God met me in a dream and told me, you're going to do this and you're going to do it there, period. That's it, right? But then others are less sure. Previous conversations and experiences may have pointed people in this particular direction, but they're still exploring, they're still testing the water, and then we throw them in off the deep end of the pool. And the challenges described earlier lead to anxiety and sometimes doubt. Is this really for me? Can I do it? And how can I know? To some extent, this is to be expected because professional development is not a linear process of growth. But I think it helps to keep in mind the well-known distinction between primary and secondary callings. In everyday speech, even among Christians, it's become common to speak of our calling or our vocation in mostly secular terms, as if those words were only synonyms for job, albeit with some super added sense of purpose, perhaps. But calling implies a personal act by which we are called by or to someone, just as Jesus called the 12 to follow him. So as Os Guinness, for example, has said, quote, our primary calling as followers of Christ is by him, to him, and for him. First and foremost, we are called to someone, God, not to something or to somewhere. We may then have one or more secondary callings in response to the primary call, and one might say that both how we live and what we do for a living are meant to embody that response. But historically, the ongoing challenge has been to hold the primary and secondary senses of our vocation together and to keep first things first. Guinness notes two typical ways of distorting the relationship between the primary and the secondary. The first one was suggested earlier, that vocation becomes understood in a way that minimizes the relevance of a God who calls, so that the word becomes barely distinct from the word job or occupation. The second and opposite error is to over-spiritualize the language of calling so that only people who pursue full-time ministry are said to have a calling from God, which robs the possibility of other pursuits having a more sacred dimension to them. And to those, I would personally add a third distortion, which I suspect is quite common among evangelicals, although I don't have any hard data on that. If somebody wants to do that as a dissertation project, talk to me. <laughs> and that is believing that God calls us into one specific form of service or career which we must 
discover if we are to have God's blessing. Something like a career-oriented version of the romantic ideal of a soulmate. I'm not sure what else to call that, job mate or some such thing. (laughs) This distortion conflates our primary and our secondary callings in a way that often leads to anxiety and to shame for those who are still in the process of exploring. Against those kinds of distortions, a Christian sense of vocation must preserve the distinction between the primary and the secondary, and both of those need to be rightly ordered in relationship to each other. Put differently, the life story of anyone who claims to follow Christ must have a substantively transcendent dimension to it, by which personal narratives are embedded within a larger biblical meta narrative. And I fear that the gospel sometimes is presented in such a way that tacitly makes that difficult. The message is, you have a problem, and Jesus is the answer. Now, that's not wrong as far as it goes, but it risks reinforcing a tendency towards a kind of theological narcissism. We see God as a character in our stories, albeit an important one, without a corresponding ability to imagine how we might be characters in God's story. The primary and secondary aspects of our vocation, in other words, are not on the same logical footing. The first stands in a meta-relationship to the second. And Christians have a great deal of freedom of choice in pursuing their secondary callings. And that should not be thought of as picking from or even agonizing over a list of acceptable careers. The question is not, is it okay for a Christian to be a therapist? And the question is not, will God reject me if I don't make the right career choice? The question is, if I become a therapist, in what way can this embody my primary calling to do the work of Christ? Because that way of thinking, I believe, can give us some vocational freedom and help us endure some of the growing pains and the intrinsic difficulty of the work. Now, as a side note, I think similar observations could be made about the decision to pursue vocational ministry. It's too easy to assume that it's not only acceptable but praiseworthy for Christians to devote themselves to congregational ministry or to mission work. This is for you, Kurt. How's that? But we should never take for granted that such a choice automatically fulfills one's primary vocation. And again, I have no hard data on this, but I suspect that many pastors over-identify their primary service to God with their secondary choice to serve a local congregation. And then they experience a crisis of meaning when the congregation doesn't sufficiently appreciate their gifts. (laughs) But that's another discussion for another time. So around what theme, then, might we organize a coherent and integrated sense of vocation? The one that I have used most consistently in recent years, the one that I find the most compelling and fruitful, is peacemaking. I'm not claiming that this is the only theme possible, nor that I reached it at the end of a long chain of logical deduction, but the choice has personal significance for me. So I need to tell you a story. I think back to when I was about probably 11 or 12 years old. I really can't be sure what age I was. I was not a Christian. Again, I was not raised in a Christian family, wasn't raised in the church. My only experience of church was when we would go to visit my grandparents and we were forced to go with them, right? And I don't really remember understanding anything of what was happening in there. I do remember wondering why it was that I had to put the quarter in the plate instead of just spending it. And for some reason, at about that age, I suddenly decided that it was time to get religious. My grandmother had given me a Bible you may, have, you may have one like this somewhere buried in a drawer, a little pocket-sized New Testament, a Gideon New Testament with Psalms. This one has Proverbs as well, right? And not knowing what else to do with it, I pulled that down off of my shelf and I started reading with the Gospel of Matthew. And the experience was less like reading a book and more like trying to decipher a relic because the leatherette cover on there smelled musty and the pages were yellowed and I started with the genealogy and there were all those unpronounceable names and there were all those begats in there and it was King James. (laughs) I was trouble in trouble right from the beginning 
So I persevered, right? I got to the Christmas story that was good. I got to the story of John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus that was okay. I got to the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness that was weird. <laughs> and then I got to chapter five and the Sermon on the Mount. And I have to tell you, it was kind of like standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon. I didn't know anything about Jesus and I didn't really understand what he was trying to say, but I knew that somehow this was important. This was something that needed to be taken seriously, but I had a problem with the very first part of the sermon, those paradoxical, mysterious verses that I would later come to know as the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and so on. I was only a kid, but even then I knew that whatever it was that Jesus was trying to say, it didn't sound like any kind of blessing I had ever heard of before. <laughs> Poverty of spirit, mourning, meekness, hunger and thirst, not a great place for a middle-class suburban American kid to start learning how to get religious. Now it was gonna be a few more years before I would become a believer, and it would be decades more before I would circle back and actually study and write about Jesus' notion of blessing in the Beatitudes. Jesus, I believe, was sketching a countercultural portrait of the Messianic kingdom that was upside down from what most people then, and I think even now, expected. And I'll say more about the Beatitudes over the next two lectures, but for the moment, suffice it to say that I take these verses to have an inherent logic, and I take the statement, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God, to be the culmination of that logic and a fitting theme around which to organize an understanding of our primary vocation. So let me conclude this first lecture then with a brief overview of how I understand the task and the vocation of peacemaking. Jesus was not, of course, introducing an entirely new idea. He quoted frequently from the prophecies of Isaiah in which peace, or in the Hebrew, shalom, was often cited as a sign of God's salvation in general and of the Messianic age in particular. That word shalom is rich in meaning. I'm reminded, for example, of Cornelius Plantinga's memorable characterization of shalom as the way things ought to be. Here's a quote. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied, natural gifts fruitfully employed, a state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. So think, for example, of the creation story in Genesis 1. Six times as the story proceeds, God looks at what he's created and he pronounces it good. And by the end of the sixth day, he looks back over everything that he has created and sees that it is very good. That's my picture of Shalom that everything is the way it was created to be, that everything is the way that it ought to be from the hand of a loving and gracious God. Now that might sound like too grand of an abstraction, but if you look at the way that the word is actually used in the Old Testament, it encompasses an ordinary everyday sense of well-being. Genesis 37, 14, Jacob sends his son Joseph to see if it is well with his brothers. 1 Samuel 17, 18, Jesse sends David to see how his brothers fare because they followed Saul into battle. Psalm 38, 3, the psalmist complains, there's no health in my bones because of my sin. And in each case, the word used to indicate some aspect of well-being is shalom. We could take that further. When God promises a covenant blessing of shalom to his people, he does so in terms that would resonate with their way of life naming things that they would naturally long for, the gift of rain, a plentiful harvest, a sense of safety that allows them to sleep peacefully, the removal of hunger and fear and shame. In our world, in the contemporary world, we most often think of peace as the absence of conflict, but that's only one side of a much richer concept. It's more than just the absence of things that are negative. Peace as shalom is the presence of things positive of health, wholeness, safety, and prosperity, all ultimately in a context of justice in relationships between people and between nations. When I teach this concept to couples, I ask them to imagine Genesis 1. And then I ask them to answer this question. 
What would need to happen in your marriage right now for God to look at your relationship and say, it is good? It might be something as simple as a momentary truce, but the more constructive side of things, the more constructive side of shalom could be found in perhaps taking hold of some thread of hope for their future, for their hunger to do what's right with respect to one another, their commitment to cultivating the qualities of humility and compassion. All of these, the absence of the negative and the presence of the positive, to me, are examples of the human embodiment of shalom. So my proposal, again, is that at least part of the need for integration stems from problems of narrative coherence and that the related ideas of shalom and peacemaking can provide the thematic basis for an integrated understanding of our vocation. For therapists to be peacemakers may include helping people to resolve conflict, but it must extend far beyond that. Peacemaking requires a robustly eschatological vision, which in turn means cultivating the ability to imagine our secondary callings being taken up into the redemptive purposes of God. It is God who desires shalom for a creation spoiled by sin, and it is God who by grace calls us to be agents of that shalom. I think here of what I suspect may be the most widely cited passage from the prophecy of Jeremiah. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for your harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. That word in verse 11, which the New Revised translates as welfare, is, of course, shalom. God's plan for his people, in other words, is peace. But unfortunately, the verse is often used in a theologically narcissistic way. I've heard Jeremiah 29, 11 cited over and over in sermons and in conversations between Christians. And the message is usually that if we would just keep the faith, keep praying, and keep waiting, God will fix whatever is problematic in our stories. When verses 12 and 13 are added, it's often in the context of calling the embattled American church to pray diligently for God's help to survive and thrive in the midst of a godless society. But seldom is the famed 11th verse quoted together with the verse that comes immediately before it. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise to bring you back to this place. The idea of waiting 70 years just rubs our tacit theology the wrong way. We'd rather take hold of God's promise of peace right now by making it the happy ending to the dramatic tensions in our own life stories. But Jeremiah, of course, will have none of it. The promise will be kept, but on God's eschatological calendar, not ours. Meanwhile, what? If verse 10 often goes unaccounted for, so does verse 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Seek the shalom city, says God, through the prophet, for in its shalom you will find your shalom. Another quote from Walter Brueggemann. Imagine that. A letter written to displaced persons in hated Babylon, and the speaker for the vision dares to say, your shalom will be found in Babylon's shalom. The well-being of the chosen ones is tied to the well-being of that hated metropolis with the chosen people, which the chosen people fear and resent. Depending on how deep the hatred and how great the fear, this promise of shalom with hated Babylon is a glorious promise or a sobering thought. But it is our best vision a vision always rooted in and addressed to historical realities. Centuries later, the Apostle Peter, writing to scattered and persecuted Christians, would also address them as exiles, and he would advise them never to repay evil or abuse in kind, but to repay with blessing instead, because they were a people who pursue peace, that they might inherit a blessing. Exiles seek peace, and in so doing, they find their shalom. Now, I don't know how often or how deeply we here in this room might think of ourselves as exiles. I suspect that there's quite a broad spectrum of how much displacement and marginalization each of us has experienced. 
But if the truth be told, some of us pray for revival in Babylon without recognizing the extent to which we have tacitly become Babylonians ourselves. Even if we don't like everything about the culture in which we live, we're quite comfortable here. Thank you very much. And yet we are called to actively seek the shalom of the city. That, I believe, is one way to thematize the primary vocation of a Christian therapist. The mental health needs of our communities, and dare we say it, of our churches, are great. In and through our secondary vocation as psychotherapists, or those who in some way support the provision of mental health services, we engage our primary calling to be peacemakers, agents of shalom. And that calling, of course, is not unique to therapists, but it may be particularly important to Christian therapists and therapists in training to understand, where they will have direct influence over the lives of others and train in contexts that can often undermine their narrative coherence. We need to get the story of our primary calling straight before considering its secondary expressions. We must first begin to take hold of our identity as those who have been called to participate in God's work of shalom making, because only then can we coherently ask how peacemaking might be expressed in the relationship between therapist and client. That will be the subject of our next two lectures. Thank you. <laughs>